Can I ask you a question? Sure. How come you wear a tie? I read an article once that said you should dress for the job you want, not the job you have. So how long you been wearing that tie? 15 years. Growing up, I was a cartoon junkie, and I was absolutely obsessed with Cartoon Network. And while I love shows of the era, like Ed, Ed, Nettie, Johnny Bravo, and Dexter's Lab, their boomerang block gave me an appreciation for the classics. So when DC Comics announced in 2016 that they were starting Hanna-Barbera Beyond, a new land of comics that was going to take some classic Hanna-Barbera properties and reimagine them in drastic ways, I was intrigued. Now, I've already covered the pure insanity that was Scooby Apocalypse, complete with its emoji-powered Scoob and super buff Scrappy, in a dedicated video, but my favorite of these comics was by far The Flintstones. This book has no right to be as good as it is, but as the kids say, it's woke AF and based. Jesus Christ, you're pushing 30. You gotta stop this. So today, let's have a gay old time and dive into this underrated classic that's sure to rile up the kinds of folks that I never wanted to subscribe to my channel in the first place. Hey, it's good to see you. Thanks for the click. But before we get too far into things, I need to give a quick thank you to my all-time favorite sponsor, Magic Spoon. When I was watching cartoons as a kid, cereal was my go-to snack, especially a topical fruity one that I can't legally mention here. But now that I'm paying more attention to my health, Magic Spoon has been a great replacement. I have been absolutely destroying boxes of the new gingerbread and honey gram flavors with no remorse, because it's got 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, 4 net grams of carbs, and only 140 calories in a serving. They're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, without skimping on any of the flavor. Like, seriously, this stuff is good. Honestly, just give it a try for yourself, especially since they have a 100% happiness guarantee that offers a complete refund if you don't like it, no questions asked. Just go to magicspoon.com drake and use my code drake for $5 off your very own variety box with flavors like cinnamon, blueberry, or even maple waffle. Shipping just started in Canada and the UK, so it's more accessible than ever. Thank you very much, Magic Spoon, for your continued support. But now, let's get back to the video. The original Flintstones cartoon was all about taking 1960s suburbia and throwing it back into the Stone Age, deliberately riffing on sitcoms of the era by showcasing the absurdity of society and day-to-day -day life by juxtaposing it with the show's prehistoric aesthetic. What did happen to your dreams, Fred? What kept you from going to college? Only one little thing. I never got out of high school. Why not? <laughs> I'll tell you why not, because I was young and strong and stupid. The brilliant thing about adapting this property is that all you really need to do is give the societal and political commentary a modern day update, which I think the 2016 comic does a fantastic job of. Writer Mark Russell nails the satire by allowing the absurdity of its setting to play out, but the comic is also way more sad and existential than you might expect going in. And I'm not just talking about the infamous We Participated in a Genocide Barney panel that's been making the rounds. See, the comic features all sorts of allusions to the trappings and failings of 21st century life, with things like multi-level marketing, overspending on military budget at the expense of civic endeavors, and corporate executives laying off their workforce during times of record profits just so that their stock price can bump up a couple of percents. Which, yeah, those are all part of the horrible reality that we currently live in, but the freaking Flintstones comic of all things shines a magnifying glass on deeper and more personal issues as well. For example, how about a sobering reflection on the supposed finality of marriage? If we say that nothing is forever, then what makes them what makes them what makes love the exception? What about the feeling of creating art, but your work not being able to connect with people, adding to the feeling of isolation and being misunderstood as your deeply personal means of self-expression are lost on everyone, including your closest loved ones? And hey, did you need a heart-wrenching side plot about the horrifying existence of a bowling ball whose entire life's meaning is being savagely thrown into objects only to be swept into a dark tunnel where he contemplates death just to be spit out to do it over and over and over again? Oh, and his best friend is a vacuum cleaner who's scared of the dark that's placed into the closet night after night, and the only thing that gives him the strength to keep going is knowing that his best friend Bowling Ball is on the other side of the door. That story, by the way, reaches its climax when Wilma gets Fred a new bowling ball, and Vacuum's only friend in the world is sent off to be recycled into mystery meat to be fed to other home appliances. Yabba dabba doo, everybody! Okay, let's get off of the dark stuff for a quick second. See, the comic is set in the recently established city of Bedrock, following the near extinction of the land's indigenous people to make room via genocidal war. Fred, a veteran of said war, is now having to cut it in a world where his physical strength is essentially meaningless. 
Bedrock is a consumerist dystopia, as the city's complacent citizens seek out physical goods to fill the void of their lives. The media only serves to enforce the status quo, sugarcoating everything by ignoring facts and just telling the viewers what they want to hear. The rich and powerful can pay people to perform dangerous actions for their own amusement, even if it leads to their actual death. Sentient beings with thoughts and feelings are used as literal tools without names other than their function. Older and more conservative folks are scared of this new thing called marriage, as it's a slap in the face to the sanctity of polyamorous sex caves. And even when the concept of marriage is more broadly accepted, gay couples look down upon, and that offends Fred, because if Adam and Steve can't get married, then what's the point? Yeah, I know, a good amount of the satire in this book is extremely on the nose, but in my opinion, it doesn't detract from the humor or storytelling. It is a goddamn Flintstones comic. The original cartoon was never subtle, so why would this thing have to be? Also, I realized that I never commented on the art yet. So when the series was first announced, the promo art didn't inspire much confidence for me personally. But when Steve Pugh came on board, my mind was instantly changed. Obviously, this is a lot less cartoony than the literal cartoon, but in my opinion, it works. The visuals are more realistic, sure, but they're true to the aesthetic of the show, and they somehow look better than the actual live-action movie. But, okay, I have to get a little self-indulgent here. So, the various Hanna-Barbera books did crossovers with DC superheroes, and my all-time favorite hero, Booster Gold, was chosen for the Flintstones. And man, what a brilliant pairing. For those of you that are somehow not in the know, Booster Gold is a time-traveling hero from the future, something that already has precedence in the Flintstones franchise with the old Jetson crossovers. In this comic, Booster gets stranded in the past and needs to repair his time sphere, but obviously, since this is the Stone Age, that's easier said than done. I mean, hell, the city's most brilliant scientists can't even grasp the concept of the number one million. By the way, this panel is really dumb because the abacus absolutely goes to one million. Of course, the time machine goes awry, and chaos ensued as Booster Gold ended up bringing a bunch of prehistoric stuff to the future, but then everything gets fixed. This issue was honestly the low point of the whole series, but any excuse to talk about my favorite boy, I'm gonna take it. Despite all of that, I still really love this series. It's a solid example of a non-cape comic, and an even better example of reinterpreting an established license to make something new that stands on its own, while still keeping the spirit of the original. The book is also relatively short at only 12 issues, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. I highly recommend giving it a shot, so by all means, pick it up at your local comic shop or at my affiliate link in the description. And if you like this video, then please consider subscribing. And if you want to hear me talk more about these Hanna-Barbera comics, then maybe consider checking out my video that I did on Scooby Apocalypse. It's a wild ride. But anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.